Welcome back. I hope you had a nice break and you're ready to learn about 3D printing. So, first question, what is 3D printing, sir? That's a great question. And the answer is, I can't give you an answer because 3D printing encompasses a whole range of different things. And if you type 3D printing into Google, it will come up with hundreds of different types of 3D printing. So that's not going to help you. It's not going to help you revise for the exam, that's for, that's for sure. So, um, with with um, recognising that there's loads of different types of 3D printing, I'm only going to mention four, which um, I think are useful for pharmaceuticals. And within that, we're only going to talk about three of them, actually, in this lecture. So the four that I think are useful are powder bed printing, fused deposition modelling, uh, stereolithography and selective laser sintering. Of those... Stereo lithography, we're not going to talk about today, but the reason it's on this slide is because if you come up to my laboratory, you will see that we have multiple examples of these different types of printing systems. And we have PhD students who are doing their theses, looking at each one of the applications um, from these printing systems. So I know that they're all useful, but from the perspective of this lecture, at least, because we don't have a lot of time, we're not going to talk about stereo lithography. We're just going to talk about the other three. Why do I think it's useful? It's useful because unlike inkjet printing, a 3D printer, uh, printer is, is depositing something more solid. It's not, it's not jetting a liquid. It's usually depositing a, a solid material. It, it may be a molten solid, but it will be a solid by the time the object is being printed. That, that might be a polymer. It might be a powder for pharmaceuticals anyway. I'm sure you're familiar, but if you look in the world of 3D printing, it's possible to print metals, for instance, as well. But we don't do that for pharmaceuticals. I don't think anyone wants to swallow a metal tablet, do they? So certainly polymers and powders are really kind of useful for making pharmaceutical devices and 3D printers can print those things. The other thing they can do is because they can print polymers, as I said already, it's also possible to print devices. So a lot of um, medical devices that you might think about, and medical devices can mean all sorts of things, can't they? Catheters, through to pacemakers, through to things that are implanted in surgery. A lot of those things are made of polymers. Um, and so that the sorts of medical grade polymers you might think of lend themselves very well to being printed with a 3D printer. So really a, a 3D printer can print both devices and dosage forms, and that makes it kind of useful. And you might have said to me a few years ago, this is very interesting, sir, 3D printing. And I'm loving the concept, but I don't really think there's ever going to be a 3D printed product on sale. And I would say to you, well, 10, well, 10 years ago, I'd have said to you, yeah, I think you're probably right. But that will change in 2015 because the FDA, which is the US drug regulator, as I'm sure you know, uh, approved a product. It's called Spritam, and, and that is on the market as we speak. And so Spritam is made in a factory with 3D printers, as we're going to look at in just a moment. And so you can actually be prescribed that product. And when you take it, you are actually taking a 3D printed product. So there is one example now of a 3D printed product on the market. Not a lot of examples, I'm not arguing with that. But nonetheless, the fact that there is one says to me at least that in a few years time, there's going to be more, right? So it's worth looking at. So on the screen in front of you is a box of Spritam. Uh, on the right and on the left is a Spritam tablet. Doesn't look very exciting, does it? In fact, it looks very much like an ordinary tablet. And I've got a feeling that if you were a member of the public taking that product, you wouldn't actually know it was 3D printed, not, not care. <laughs> you, on the other hand, as diligent pharmacy students, uh, you do care. And so we're going to talk about how it's made, okay? How is it made? It's made with powder bed printing. What is powder bed printing, sir, I hear you ask? I'm going to come back to it in just a second. So hang on. But for now, before we look at uh, some funky videos that are coming up, all I'll say is in powder bed printing, you have a powder and you spray a glue to glue those powder particles together. It's not a very strong glue, um, like super glue or something like that. It's just a weak PVA solution, which is wood glue, isn't it? So you're effectively using wood glue to stick the powder particles together uh, very weakly. And so when they come into contact with water, instantly they disperse and that's kind of handy for this product um, because this product contains a drug which is used to treat someone having an epile epileptic seizure okay so someone's having a seizure they're not going to be in a state to swallow a medication are they so the idea of this is that when uh, the seizure has finished 
you can give um, a patient this product by putting it into their mouth and because it's fast dispersing because it's only weakly bound particles holding it together in the first place it will disperse in the mouth and be absorbed very quickly that's good another thing that's quite interesting about this product is because is if you think about it in a normal tablet you've got all sorts of excipients that are helping that tablet to function so you might have binders and diluents and disintegrants and film coats so there's all sorts of things that you might include into a tablet and they all take up space in that tablet i mean you can get less drug okay in this instance you can, if you really want to, just glue together drug particles. No need for excipients. You can just have drug particles and you glue them together with the binder and that's your product. No need to add anything else. So as a consequence of that, the amount of that tablet which is available to be drug rather than excipient is a lot higher. And therefore you can end up with some surprisingly large drug contents in these tablets and it's available in four dose strengths, 250, 500, 750 and 1000 milligrams. A thousand milligrams, that's, a, that's one gram in a tablet. That's a lot, isn't it? You wouldn't ordinarily swallow a tablet that was one gram, but of course this isn't a swallowable tablet, is it? It's an oro-dispersing tablet, so it's quite a lot of drug powder in your mouth at one go. But nonetheless, you can't really get to these dosages with conventional tablet pressing, because unless the drug had absolutely perfect uh, properties for compaction, and at the same time it then dispersed, when swallowed, you're going to have to add excipients. So if you try and have a thousand milligrams of a drug in a tablet, you're going to have excipients as well. And then that tablet is starting to get up to one and a half, two grams, and no one's going to swallow a tablet that big. So one of the reasons that Spritam is made with 3D printing is because it allows you to make a high dose tablet and an oro dispersing tablet. Now it'd be very difficult to do that with a different type of manufacturing route. Okay? How? fast does a Spritam tablet disperse? I hear you ask, I know you want to know, and the answer is Spritam have made this tremendous video to show you how fast the tablet actually disperses in water and they're going to compare it with a conventional fast melt tablet like a Nurofen meltlet. Okay so let's watch and see how fast it goes. That was fast, wasn't it? Uh, just a matter of seconds, maybe four or five seconds, and that disperses. So that same thing would happen in your mouth. How does a powder bed printer work? I hear you ask, because I know you want to know. The answer is, it's really a fusion between um, a typical powder, normal um, powder tablet manufacturer and inkjet printing, funny enough. So it doesn't really extrude or print a solid, it actually jets a liquid from the inkjet printer. And the inkjet printer is printing a binding solution or the glue. So on the screen is a diagram of how a powder bed printer works. On one side you have your feed. So in all 3D printing you have a feedstock material. So that's the raw material that goes into the printer. And in this case it's a powder. That powder is contained within a hopper, so you don't get powder everywhere. And when you want to print something, the hopper, which is on the left of the screen, raises slightly. And because it raises, it produces some powder at the bottom of the printer. A roller then goes across the bottom of the printer and spreads the powder particles out into a thin layer. In principle, you want each powder particle next to each other. So you should have one layer of powder particles, which is one powder particle thick, if that makes any sense. So you spread them out so you get all your powder particles next to each other. And then what happens is an inkjet printer comes along and it prints a binding solution only where you want the powder particles to stick together. So imagine you're making a tablet. A tablet's a disc, isn't it? So if you want to make a disc, each layer of that disc is going to be a circle. So the inkjet printer is simply going to print a circle of glue over the powder particles and that glue is going to uh, stick those powder particles together. Any other powder particles on that powder bed which have not been inkjet printed with a glue are not going to stick together. Okay, So this process cycles many times. You inkjet print some glue to bind one layer together. The object drops down slightly. Some more powder is produced. The roller spreads it across. 
The inkjet printer then prints a, another um, circle of glue. The object goes down, roller goes across, and the process cycles. And your object is created layer by layer. In a conventional printer, your object is going to be created in a sort of cylinder of bound powder particles and unbound powder particles. And so once you've finished printing, you're going to put your hand in, you're going to pull out the object, shake off the unbound particles, and your, your object should be left behind. Is this house bright and made? I hear you ask. And the answer is kind of. If I asked you at this particular moment of the lecture, what do you think? the Sprite Town factory looks like. If you're following, I think you might say to me, well, I reckon that they've got individual powder bed printers in the factory, lots and lots of different stations, each one with a powder bed printer, and someone is pressing print at each one of those stations and then taking the powders out. And I would say it's a pretty reasonable guess, but that's not what they did. They did something really clever with their system to make it um, much more commercially viable. And again, handily, they made a video to show you how they make these tablets. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at the 3D printing process. First, a powdered medicine is spread into a thin layer. Then, a liquid is dropped onto the powder to selectively bind the particles together into a thin porous layer. This process is repeated a specific number of times to add more layers based on the dosage, building the product from bottom to top. The result is a porous drug product that disintegrates with just a sip of liquid. Learn more at Apprecia.com. Pretty clever, I think you'd have to agree. So what they did was they changed the way that the manufacturing is done so that the powder progresses through the factory on a conveyor belt. And on that conveyor belt, it goes through multiple stations. One station has an inkjet printer printing a binding solution, and the next station actually deposits more powder. So you start with a layer of powder on the conveyor belt. It moves along. The next station is an inkjet printer that prints a circle of glue. The next station drops more powder. The next station is another binding solution, and so on. It just repeats. And then you take the tablets off the production line at the end. Very clever. And it means that they, they took um, a printing system which you might be able to use individually in a laboratory and they made it commercially viable. So really clever piece of engineering, I think. So that's the only product on the market which is currently made with a 3D printer. But there are some other types of 3D printing that I think are really, really promising for making pharmaceutical products. And we have them upstairs in the lab. We've published numerous papers on them. We have a company that develops 3D printed products, actually. I might put a link to that at the end of the lecture. And the two that we use, which we're going to talk about before we finish this lecture, one is called fused deposition modeling and the other one is selective laser sintering. So let's start with fused deposition modeling or FDM. Now, you might have heard of this too, actually. I first came across this type of printing when I was reading the newspaper on the train commuting into London. Remember those days? I haven't done it for a while. <laughs> Thanks to COVID. I'm sure they will be back. Uh, soon. So the newspaper is a fantastic thing for explaining new technologies. And I was reading the paper one day and it said an American company is selling a printer that you can put together yourself and it allows you to print absolutely anything. And I thought, well, that's really interesting, isn't it? And so as soon as I got into the school, I ordered one of the printing systems from the company. Uh, it is the printing system, which is shown on the screen in front of you. And we started printing some um, tablets. I'll show you those tablets in just a second. How does it work? It works with a feedstock material, as always. And in this case, the feedstock is an extruded polymer filament. Filament just meaning a really long strand of something. OK, so that feedstock material is fed into the printer and the print head itself is nothing more than a heater to sort of soften or melt, and, uh, melt that polymer, plus a motor which um, drives two cogs and the two cogs grip the filament and they kind of force it down through the print head. So as the material goes through the print head, it heats up, the polymer melts, and then it's extruded through a small nozzle. The nozzle in our printer is, is 100 microns. And then in order to build an object, you design it in some CAD software. The software splits the object into horizontal layers and the printer prints each horizontal layer in turn, starting with the bottom, obviously. So your print head goes over the build plate. It extrudes polymer where there is meant to be some polymer and the printhead moves back and forwards in a raster pattern, depositing polymer to build up layer number one of your object. 
Then the build plate drops, layer number two is printed, drops and so on. Your object is created layer by layer and you take it off the printer at the end. One of the benefits of these printing systems, even back when we first bought one nearly a decade ago, is you can have multiple um, polymer feedstocks going into the print head. It's typically either two or three. I mean, there's no reason why you can't have more, but the sorts of printers that we buy, uh, they have two or three different print heads that can print material simultaneously. So you think about that, you could have one drug in one polymer filament and a different drug in a different polymer filament. And so it's very easy to create multiple drugs in one tablet using this type of printer system because you can just have different feedstock materials in the same print head. It is also possible, if you're gonna ask me this, to put the same drug into two different polymers. Why might you do that? <laughs> you might reasonably ask. The answer is because you might put one of the, um, one portion of the drug into a polymer which is highly water soluble and another part into say a polymer which is almost like an enteric polymer maybe one that dissolves at a specific pH and then you can create a tablet that has a burst release and a sustained release as it goes down the GI tract for instance so you can do all sorts of things with this type of um, printing. There is one huge advantage to FDM printing and that actually is the feedstock material itself so I said that the feedstock is a polymer filament, an extruded polymer filament. You might reasonably ask, uh, how do we make that filament, sir? And the answer is we made it, make it with a technique called hot melt extrusion or hot, uh, HME. HME is kind of interesting because it's a standard pharmaceutical processing technique. If you're trying to make a solid amorphous dispersion, for instance, then what you do is you put your drug and your polymer into a hopper and they are fed into a hot melt extruder. A hot melt extruder typically has two counter-rotating screws that spin like this, plus it can be heated. And so what happens is you melt your polymer and you force the polymer and the drug to mix together by the screws counter-rotating, and then it forces that mixture out of a nozzle to make this really fine filament. Typically, if you're making an amorphous dispersion at least, you then chop the filament into pellets and that's put into a capsule or something like that. And so in this instance, all you need to do is use the same hot melt extruder, but you don't chop into pellets at the end because you actually want that filament. And so it's kind of handy because hot melt extrusion is already a pharmaceutical processing technique. So it's really simple to make extruded filaments containing drugs. The technology is already there. And uh, that means that you can also use um, a GMP facilities. GMP means good manufacturing practice, and it's a manufacturing standard which must be met in order to make products for human use. And so there are a lot of HME systems uh, in GMP facilities. There was a lot of acronyms, wasn't there, in that sentence, which I apologise. And there's another one coming up now, which is you can use grass polymers. What is grass? I don't hear you ask. The answer is generally regarded as safe. Bit of an American term, actually, but it's an FDA term which says if you use one of these excipients and they've been used for the last hundred years, nobody's seen any negative effects of using these excipients. And so they are assumed to be safe. So if you use a grass excipient in your formulation, the FDA doesn't ask you to demonstrate it's safe in human trials. It is accepted that it is safe. So let's just go through these acronyms one more time, shall we? HME is hot melt extrusion, which is the technique that you're using to blend the drug and the polymer together to make the filament. It can be done under GMP conditions, which is good manufacturing practice. So you can use those for human use. And we can use polymers that are uh, grass polymers or generally regarded as safe. OK, so many, many benefits there to this type of printing. When we started with this type of printing system, we were buying commercially extruded polymers. You can buy them on big spools from, well, the Internet now. There used to be a 3D printing shop actually up um, um, not that far from the school, actually. It was only about um, a mile away. It was, the, it was the UK's first 3D printing store, actually. We used to go out there and buy the, um, buy the rolls of um, filament. But they tend to come in standard polymers for making objects. So those would be PVA, PLA or ABS. So uh, you can look at those polymers, but they're not, they're not really useful for, um, for pharmaceutical use. ABS in particular is what is used to make Lego bricks. And I think nobody really wants to be swallowing Lego bricks, do they? It's not going to dissolve in the body. It's going to be rather painful coming out. Uh, PVA is okay-ish, uh, and PLA is also not too bad, actually. So we did tend to use PLA and PVA polymers at the start because we could buy these ex extruded 
uh, polymers directly and we weren't extruding our cells but now we have a whole range of extruders and we extrude pharmaceutical grade polymers and we mix our own um, drugs. In fact last year the company developed and launched its own 3D printing system which can actually blend drug and polymer together in the printhead actually. So you just put your drug powder into a small hopper on the printhead uh, and it extrudes and prints that itself. It's called the Medimaker if you're interested and I'll put a link to that at the end of the video as well. Right, we said, we, I said already, we bought one of these printers about a decade ago and we had a go at printing various tablets. And so one of our early papers, this is from International Journal of Pharmaceutics, very good read. I highly recommend you download it. If nothing else, it will help my statistics. So I thank you for that. Shows you the sorts of tablets that we printed when we first got this printer system. Uh, they look a bit beige in colour, but that's because we were printing PLA and that's the natural colour of um, PLA. There was no drug loading in these tablets. It's just to show you what happens if you try and print the polymer into a basic tablet shape. So you can see, I think, looking at the pictures at the bottom, that the tablets do indeed look like tablets, which is good. They are obviously round in cross section and um, disc shapes. So they've got a degree of height to them. What you might not realise with a 3D printer is if you design the object in some sort of CAD software, CAD software is really defining the surface of an object. So if you're trying to make a disc like a tablet shape, it will define a circle at the top and at the bottom and a sort of edge around the side. You have to tell the printer how thick you want each of those surfaces to be, because if you don't tell it how thick it is, it will print the absolute minimum of material just to print that surface. And it would be very um, easy to break because it'd be very thin polymer film, 100 microns thick. So you can tell the printer when it starts printing how much material to fill into the void space uh, inside the object that you're printing. It's called the infill percentage. So you can see on the screen three different infill percentages, 10, 50 and 90 percent. And obviously, as you increase the infill percentage, the amount of material which is being put inside the tablet is also increasing. So. On the left, on the 10% infill, you can see there's lots of void spaces in that tablet. 50% there's less infill um, void spaces. And at 90%, you can barely see any void spaces inside that tablet. Now, from the point of view of personalizing dose, this is really useful. Each one of those tablets looks the same. To the patient, they look identical because the patient's only seen the outside of the tablet, right? But from a dose perspective, the 90% infill is going to be a higher dose tablet, if there was a drug in there at least, than the 10%. So we can change the dose of the tablet very easily by changing the infill percentage. Right? So that's kind of useful. Another thing which is kind of interesting is dissolution testing. So obviously when you put a tablet into a solution, you want the drug to be released with a defined set of kinetics. And what we discovered very early on is that uh, a low infill percentage means the tablet's got lots of void spaces, Generally, it gets faster release kinetics than a tablet with a high infill percentage because that tablet tends to be a lot denser. And so we can also change the dissolution kinetics from our tablet by changing the infill percentage. So we realized very early on that 3D printing is really handy for personalized medicines because you can control the dose, you can control the release kinetics, and as I'm going to explain in just a second, you can also make polypills. The issue of polypills is very interesting. And uh, again, many years ago, we asked an MSc student, I believe, to design some tablets in CAD software that would contain two different drugs. So that student came back with the designs that are shown on the screen, blue and white layers. Each layer represents a different drug. OK, so the blue represents one drug, white represents a second drug. And what we asked that student to do is think about how you might design um, a, a polypill that can release both drugs at the same time or could release the drugs sequentially. So what that student came up with are the designs on the screen. The top one is a design that is meant to release both drugs at the same time. So I think you can imagine you've got one drug in the blue layer, then another drug in the white, then the blue, then the white, then the blue. They're going to be exposed to dissolution medium equally and they should release drugs at the same rate. Whereas the tablet shown on the bottom, it has the blue core and a corona of a white, um, a white layer, which is the second drug. And in that instance, the white layer is going to release drug first because it's exposed to dissolution medium first. And the core is going to release the drug second. 
because the white layer has got to dissolve before the blue layer can release any drug. Uh, on the screen is just a photograph of the actual um, tablets that we made according to those um, CAD diagrams. They don't look blue and white and the reason is because it's quite difficult to find a drug which is blue and so actually all of the layers look kind of white and so it's rather boring isn't it for real but the one on the left hand side of that image I think you can see the layers there actually because the drug one of the drugs kind of crystallized out of the polymer and it's kind of white and the other drug remained dissolved and the polymer itself is kind of cream color so you can sort of see the layers on the left hand side the one in the center is the core and shell so obviously from the outside you don't see anything because it's just a continuous core and if you cut it in half and you look really closely you can see that the core itself is slightly different from the shell but you do have to squint i've got to be honest to see that now one of the things we do to work out where the drug is in our 3d printed tablet is we do a technique called raman mapping raman as i'm sure you know is a laser based spectroscopy so you, it's a laser that fires from the instrument it hits your object some of that uh, laser energy is absorbed by the material in your object and the rest is reflected back and so by looking at what's been absorbed you can kind of tell what material is what because the laser is a relatively small diameter just a, a micron or so it's possible to fire the laser at various points across the surface of your object and you can create um, or measure a spectrum at each point so by doing this sort of raster pattern you can build up a pattern of spectra for what material is where on the surface of your material. If you know, for instance, that one drug has one particular um, Raman spectrum and a different drug has a different Raman spectrum, then you can get the software to analyze the absorbances at each point and it can say, yes, this is this drug and this is this drug. And moreover, the software can also color code um, which drug it thinks is where. So on the screen, you can see some very colorful images that are red and green. The reason they are red and green is because we actually made these tablets with a 3D printer and we included two different drugs, caffeine and paracetamol. Caffeine is colored um, green by the software and paracetamol is colored uh, red. OK, um, so uh, hang on. So paracetamol is colored red. That's right. Paracetamol is colored red. Yeah. So what that means is if you put the multi-layer capsule into a dissolution bath you'd expect both drugs to be released at the same rate so if you look at the image on the top top left that shows you the dissolution profile for the multi-layer tablet and you can see both drugs are being released at the same time the image on the right on the other hand shows you what happens with the core and shell in this instance caffeine is in green and so it's on the outside of the tablet and paracetamol is red it's on the core so it should be released second and you can see that the caffeine is released almost instantly and the paracetamol is released a lot more slowly so this is a very characteristic thing for 3d printing that you can control not only the dose but also the release kinetics from your tablets i mentioned right at the start that study in the lancet for um, antihypertensive medication and giving patients four different antihypertensives to control blood pressure. So we took that Lancet paper and we gave it to one of our MSc students, always use an MSc student for these things. And we said to that student, right, go into the laboratory and see if you can print a tablet that contains all four of those antihypertensives at the doses used in that Lancet study. The idea being that a patient would take one of these tablets and get all four drugs in the correct dose compared with having to take four different tablets at the same time, right? So the photograph shows you the tablets that the students made. Uh, the four drugs are listed uh, and you can see it says type one and type two. And you might say to me, why, why are there two different types of tablets? Surely they're all going to be the same. And the answer is they're not the same because when you start making a tablet with multiple layers, I hope you can see that the top layer and the bottom layer, they have a larger surface area than the two layers in this case, but it can be more, in the center because in the center only the edge is being exposed to the dissolution medium but at the top and the bottom the whole surface is being exposed to the dissolution medium and that has a really important consequence as we discovered when we did the dissolution testing so on the screen are the dissolution tests so if you look at the top left that's what happens for polypill type 1 so polypill type 1 it had a tenolol in particular um, 
at the surface. A tenolol happens to have a really high solubility. And so what we did, without really realising it, is we put the drug with the highest solubility in one of the layers that had the highest surface area. And as I think you might imagine, the consequence of that was a tenolol was released really fast. Because not only is it a high solubility drug, it's also got the highest surface area. And so you can see that three of the drugs released with relatively similar kinetics, but a tenolol came out really fast. And that's not really what we wanted. We wanted to try and get the drugs to release at the same rate. In polypill type 2, the atenolol has been moved to one of the inner layers. So remember, the inner one just has a, a rim exposed to the dissolution medium. And that has the consequence of slowing down the dissolution rate of atenolol because its surface area is less. And at the same time, we can put some of the low solubility drugs. So if you look at the um, type 1, for instance, amlodipine is the lowest um, releasing drug, isn't it, um, from the type 1 tablet, by moving it from the centre to the edge, now it's the fastest releasing drug in the type 2. And so this is kind of important to realise that when you're making a polypill, it's got multiple different drugs, you've got to think to yourself, which of these drugs is going to be the fastest releasing? Because I want that to be in the layer with the lowest exposed surface. And which drug is going to be the slowest releasing? I want it at the exposed surface. So you need those drugs at the edge and everything else in the centre. You might also say to me, how many drugs can you get into one tablet, sir? And the answer is as many as you want, really. So um, at the moment, the most drugs we've got into one tablet is six. Doesn't mean we can't get more, but we decided to do six because the University of Nottingham published a paper where they did five OK, that's how it works in academia. You just try and go gradually to beat your competitors one paper at a time. Remember that if you go into academia. Well, the last type of printing I want to look at is um, SLS printing, which is selective laser uh, sintering. If you look at the image, which is on the screen in front of you, you might say to me, hang on a minute, sir, you made a mistake. That's the same image that you showed us earlier for powder bed printing. You've clearly gone mad and got the wrong slide. And I would say to you, actually, in the main, it's the same image, but I changed the top bit because in powder bed printing, we use an inkjet printer to deposit a glue onto our powder particles. And in selective laser sintering, we use a laser, clues in the name, isn't it? We use a laser to shine onto the powder particles and the laser is high energy. Because it's high energy, it causes the temperature of the powder particles to rise and two powder particles next to each other are going to melt and fuse together. So the laser goes over the surface of the particles, the temperature rises and falls. As it rises, the material melts. Because they're in contact, they mix, the temperature falls, and they become stuck together. Okay? That is actually what sintering means. Sintering means melting particles together to fuse them into a solid object. Other than that, the principle of this type of printing is the same. A powder reservoir, which powder is pushed up into the build plate, a roller spreads the powder into a thin layer. Rather than using the inkjet printer, the laser rasters across the surface of the material to fuse the powder particles together, creating your um, first layer of your object. That build plate goes down, new powder particles are put across the top, laser shines again and the process repeats. And again, we build up an object layer by layer. We like this type of printing for many reasons, but one is solvent free. So that's kind of useful in the pharmaceutical world. Uh, two, it uses powder particles. If you think about going to uh, Pfizer or um, Merck or some large pharmaceutical company and you said to them, I've got this new way of making medicines It's using a 3D printer. And they say, but we're used to dealing with powder compaction. You can then say to them, that's OK, because in this particular instance, um, our printer is fusing powder particles. So you've got lots of powder particles that you're using in your process already, and we're going to use the same powder particles. We're just going to stick them together with a laser rather than compact them. So that's uh, kind of useful. One thing that we did notice is that we bought a relatively cheap printer and it has a fixed wavelength laser. And that's kind of important because the laser, the wavelength of the laser is critical in determining uh, what type of material can absorb that energy and rise in temperature? And so the system that we have, you have to add a coloured dye to your powder mix 
and it's that die which interacts with the laser. So the um, the tablets that are shown on the bottom of the screen are slightly yellowy gold in colour, and that's because we have to add a gold colourant to the powder because that's what interacts with our laser to rise in temperature. So the way this works is you've got lots of drug particles, and in between those drug particles you've got this um, colourant particle. The laser shines, the dye particles absorb that laser energy, they rise in temperature, and they transmit that temperature sideways to the drug particles, and that causes them to fuse together. Yeah. Now it says at the bottom there, also good for fast dispersing tablets. Now the reason for that is because you've got uh, drug particle and drug particle, and they're only weakly bound together because they're, they're only going to fuse at the point at which they're touching, okay? And so we found that we can also make tablets which are a bit um, a bit like Spritam, Oro dispersing, uh, because the powder particles themselves are only loosely um, bound together. So what we did was, we made a tablet which was meant to be similar to a Spritam tablet, it's Oro dispersing, and we recorded a video to show you how fast the tablet we made in our laboratory disperses and you can compare it with the Spritam tablet I showed you a little while ago. You ready? So, watch this video. Amazed? So are we. So we managed to make a tablet in our own laboratory which performed very similar to a Spritam tablet, uh, but we used a different type of printing technology. And I, I think it's really key to understand that although the, the way that the, the printer is working is slightly different, the properties of the tablet that you make can be very similar. Right, we're going to finish the lecture with just a couple of thoughts about, um, about how we might use printing for um, products. One is I'm sure that uh, if I said to you right at the start, what do you think 3D printing is going to be used for in medicines? You might say to me, uh, I think it's going to be used to uh, print body parts, sir. So in the future, when I need a kidney transplant, I'm just going to go to the hospital and they're going to print me a new kidney and so on, things like that. And, and in the main, I'm going to agree with you. I reckon in 20 years time, we probably will be printing uh, body parts. And so that's called regenerative medicine. And UCL actually has a centre for regenerative medicine. It's based at the Royal Free um, Hospital. And so at the moment, and it's not super advanced, I think, the principle of using um, printing to make body parts. But nonetheless, the principle, at least, is to mix 3D printing and inkjet printing together. And the reason you do that is because the 3D printer allows you to print something of quite bulky, but the inkjet printer allows you to seed it with something. So typically you would print a matrix or a scaffold with a 3D printer. So an example is shown on the screen. Uh, you can print that scaffold to um, match a body part. So let's, for instance, say you go to the hospital and you have some sort of MRI scan, let's say of your ear, then the MRI scanner, funny enough, an MRI scanner already, it, um, it creates images layer by layer, and then it puts those images together to create the object that you look at on the screen. So from a printing perspective, the MRI scanner is actually doing what you want, which is the individual layers. We don't need to put them together. The printer does that for us. So you can go and have a body part scanned by the MRI scanner, and then you can print a matrix with some sort of um, biodegradable polymer that mimics that um, shape. And then you can use an inkjet printer to seed um, to that matrix with cells. So you can suspend, say, um, ear cartilage cells in um, some sort of appropriate medium, and the inkjet printer can then print that onto the scaffold. So if you have a look in the literature, you'll probably find some examples where people have had a go at printing um, various body parts. You might say to me, why would I have my ear scanned and then go and print another one? Because I've got it, haven't I? I've scanned it. And I would say um, one of the things about being human is we often have two of things two ears for instance and so if you had some sort of um, accident you're probably not going to need a replacement ear unless one of them has been ripped off in some sort of horrible accident or maybe you've been born with only one ear and you don't have um, a second ear. The beauty of the MRI scanning is that you can scan the ear that you do have and then in computer software you can create a mirror image of it and then you can print the one that you don't have okay so it's kind of useful the idea of printing if you've had an accident or you, you're missing a body part, 
you can take the one that you do have and you can mirror image it to make a new one. And if you don't, let's say you didn't have any ears, you can scan someone else's ears and print those, can't you? So it's kind of useful, the software, because it allows you to, um, to create missing bits, and that's kind of useful. When we first started inkjet printing and 3D printing, we went over to UCLH, because they also use 3D printers, and they use them for patients that have had, say, head trauma. Maybe they've got a, a bit of skull missing, and so their software can actually create a topographical image of the bit of skull that is missing and they will then print the missing skull uh, in a hard engineering polymer which they don't implant I have to say but what they will do is they'll take a titanium plate and they'll then beat it over the shape that they're 3d printed so that when they get to the surgery stage the titanium plate is already the right shape for the bit of skull which is missing so there's all sorts of ways in which you can use 3d printing in medicine for instance there are some others. So I went to a 3D printing conference a few years ago and the guy that was talking right before me was a guy called Jordan Miller and he was talking about using 3D printing to print vasculature. That means veins and arteries, doesn't it? So blood flow essentially. And what he said was one of the main barriers to printing organs is that the way that the vasculature in the human body is created is extremely complex. If you've ever been to the Body Works exhibitions, those are um, showing you where the vasculature in the human body is. Uh, and it's extremely complex and it's very difficult to model. It's almost random and chaotic. And so it can't be described with conventional uh, equations. It's quite difficult to work out how you're going to put into a computer model the vasculature of the human body. But anyway, to make a start, he develops a system where he's basically printing um, vasculature into um, gels and then he's passing blood through that vasculature and he's looking to see whether the oxygen in that blood can transmit to the cells in his matrix and the way that he does that is to print um, a, a high sugar solution um, with one printer into a matrix of um, gel which contains cells and then what he does is he washes the the sugar away because it's water soluble so wherever the sugar was it becomes a void space, very much like an artery or vein, and he can pump the blood through that. And so he's published many papers. I've just picked two that are shown on the screen in front of you to show you um, the sorts of things that you might do. And you can look these papers up. But surprise, surprise, he also has a video that shows you uh, the basic principles of what he's doing with the 3D printer. So let's take a look. Pretty amazing, I think you'd have to say. And the work that he's doing really is setting the stage for being able to print um, organs. And then another classic example of 3D printing is, and you might, I think you might have said this to me actually, is what happens if you have an accident, you break a bone and you shatter that bone. You've got nothing left to reconstruct. You might at the moment um, put a rod through the centre of the bone and try and put bone fragments and hope that it all goes back again. But it is possible to print uh, bone material. So again, here's an example on the screen in front of you. Really interesting paper where this group are developing and printing uh, hyperelastic bone substitutes. So again, materials which are uh, the same mechanical strength as bone. They're biocompatible so that they can be used in surgery. And again, you would scan the patient, get a topographical image of the bit of bone which is missing, print that object um, with these hyperelastic bone materials, and then you can plant them during surgery. There is one other example which I think is really important, and it's kind of a hot topic at the moment, and that is um, where a patient is addicted to an opioid medication. So I'm sure you're aware that there are lots of painkillers in particular that are opioid-based, and they're really, really addictive. And this is a very big problem, especially in America, and it's becoming a big problem in the UK, that people are prescribed opioids for pain relief, maybe seven days and 14 days, but they start to become addicted to those opioid medications. And it's a real issue trying to understand what you might do to get those patients off that medication. 
So there is one really clever application area, I think, for 3D printing. And that is that because FDM printers in particular can print um, polymers, remember, you can then print a tablet, which is essentially a polymer based uh, tablet. You might say to me, why would a patient want a tablet that's made out of a polymer? That doesn't seem very sensible. Isn't that swallowing the Lego bricks that you said not to do earlier, sir? And the answer is because the FDA in particular now requires any manufacturer that's going to launch an opioid based medication in the US to uh, develop and market an abuse deterrent version of that tablet. So let's say you're going to make um, a morphine tablet, something like that, and you make a, um, an immediate release oral tablet. The FDA also mandates that you make an abuse deterrent version of that tablet. What does abuse deterrent mean? It means the tablet has some sort of property that means someone who is addicted to that particular form, uh, drug can't then um, smash that tablet, extract the drug in some way and kind of overdose. And one of the ways that they permit abuse deterrent tablets to be made is to make them out of polymer. So one thing that at, um, someone that's addicted to opioids might do is take a hammer and smash a tablet, try and dissolve it to get the drug into their system faster. So you make a tablet out of polymer, it's much harder to smash and extract the drug. So again, 3D printing is kind of interesting for addressing some of the more hidden, um, unmet needs. Uh, in a way, giving medication to people for pain relief is trying to make them better, but the unintended consequence of that is they can become addicted to medications, and that can be very unfortunate. So 3D printing offers a way that we might be able to get addicted patients off opioids uh, and back onto the road to recovery. Now, we are at the end of the lecture. You'll be pleased to know or not please know if you're enjoying it. And I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts about where we might use printing in the future. So the screen says, what are the future opportunities, at least for manufacturing uh, using 3D printing? The first thing is, and think about the Sprite Am tablet we talked about already, you're not going to use 3D printing to make every tablet. If I were to go to Pfizer or Glaxo or someone like that and say, I think you should throw away all of your tablet presses and replace them with 3D printing because I think it's much better than large scale powder compaction. They're going to laugh me out of town because um, powder compaction allows you to make a vast number of unit doses at very low cost and printing is not going to replace that. So we have to be sensible and we have to recognize we are not going to replace large scale powder compaction with 3D printing. But there are a huge number of areas where I think 3D printing can really make a difference. And they're listed on the screen. Unusual drug combinations, unsurprisingly, we've looked at that, I think. Narrow therapeutic index drugs, because control of dose is absolutely critical. Consumer products, we didn't mention that, did we? So consumer products are ones when you're selling directly to the consumer. And so you're gonna go into Boots or some other large pharmacy chain, and you're confronted with all of these products on the wall in front of you. You want a way of making the consumer buy your product rather than someone else's. So let's say, for instance, that there was a 3D printer in Boots and you could go in and you said, I would like a tablet shaped like the Millennium Falcon because I really like Star Wars. I hope you're old enough to have remembered what Star Wars is, by the way. Then maybe um, the pharmacist could print you a tablet in the shape of whatever object you desire. Maybe that tablet would cost £10 each relative to a box of ibuprofen at 59p. But it doesn't matter because you want a tablet that looks like your favourite object. And people would do that. So selling directly to consumers is an interesting area that you might be able to use um, 3D printing. Oro dispersible tablets. That's not a surprise, is it? Because that's the only one that's on the market commercially at the moment. Um, Paediatric medicine. That's an interesting one. You know, one of the main barriers for children taking medicines is that they don't like tablets and they, they don't understand why they're taking them. And so if you can involve the child in the process of making the medicine, that lowers the barrier to that child taking the medicine. So I can imagine a future where you have um, a tablet. And by tablet, I mean like an Apple tablet, not a pharmaceutical tablet. And you ask that child to draw maybe a shape or a, an animal that they like. And that um, shape can then be printed. And so you're giving them the medication, but it, now it's in the shape of a tablet that they themselves have designed. And moreover, although we haven't talked about it, the printer can also print uh, gels and chewable tablets. And those tablets can be very um, pleasantly flavoured. And so you can make children take medication that they wouldn't ordinarily take 
by 3D printing. And the last one is biopharmaceuticals. I know we started by this and there aren't many examples, but I think if you can use an inkjet printer to deposit a biopharmaceutical, as long as you can keep the tertiary structure in some way, maybe by including uh, sugars like trehalose and things like that, I think you can then um, print onto um, dosage forms, tablets and films, and maybe you can overcome some of the challenges of um, acid stability, as we talked about earlier. Oh, uh, uh, oh, I said last one. There is one more at the bottom there, isn't it, which says potential for drug-loaded devices and implants. I know we haven't looked at that because this lecture isn't really about implants, but imagine that you were uh, fighting cancer and you had an anti-cancer drug that needed to be released over a really long period of time, six months. It's possible to print a device that can be implanted and then slowly release uh, drugs over time, very much like contraceptive implants. The other thing to think about is from the patient's perspective. Clearly, the printing allows you to tailor the properties of your dosage form to the patient. That can be in terms of dose and or dose combination. So that, that is fine. And we can do that now. So there's no problem for that. Um, would it be possible for a company to actually manufacture batches for specific patients? It may be. If there's enough market for something, the companies will do it. So it may be expensive, but if there's enough patients uh, and they can pay for that, there may be high value compounds. Um, there's room for 3D printing those right now. What about extempora extemporaneous manufacture or compounding, as our American friends um, like to call it? That would mean the pharmacist themselves using the printer to print medications at the point of dispensing. I remember a few years ago, I got asked to go and talk to UCL's medical students uh, in one of their sessions about um, trying to understand medicines. And they wanted to know how 3D printing might be used to, um, to make medicine. Uh, and so they asked me some questions at the end and they said, can you imagine a future, sir, where the printer is in a, med uh, in a pharmacy or even in a patient's home? And I thought, yes, I can. <laughs> I can totally imagine going to a pharmacy and the pharmacist printing medications directly for you maybe a week's worth of medications because your dose can be printed to what your needs are and the next patient to come into the pharmacy may have a different dose need but the printer can then print a dose for them. Why is this not done already you might ask and there are multiple reasons why. Uh, one of them includes the fact that um, the legal role of a pharmacist is to verify both the active and the dose of the product that's being um, dispensed and so you need a way of verifying those with the printer you need to make sure that everything is being manufactured to GMP, for instance. So I can tell you that um, we have been to the MHRA, which is the body in the UK that licenses medicines, because they have, um, it's called a horizon scannings team. So they, they look at the what technologies they think might be important for pharmacy in the future. They start to ask questions about what sort of ways in which these products might be developed or the technologies used. And so we went to talk to them about about 3D printing and they were very positive and they gave us lots of ideas of how we might ensure that the that all the products are traceable and that the pharmacist can make sure it's the right dose and it's the right um, active. So that's the focus of our research uh, right now. And if I was thinking maybe 20, 30 years down the line, I can totally imagine printers being in individual patients' homes. If you've got a long-term medical need for a particular drug, and you're going to need um, those of that drug for months and months and months. Why would you not have a printer in your own home? And then the doctor can, or the pharmacist can email the prescription directly to you. You can print your own medication. I know it's a slightly scary thought. Uh, the patients will be printing their own medication. But maybe 20 years time, then you'll be having lectures. Well, not you, but the students at the time will be having lectures about what are the ethical uh, implications of patients printing their own medication at home. Who knows? But that's where I'd like to think that the world can end up. So there we are. That's all we need to talk about with um, 3D printing and inkjet printing. I hope it's made you think, if nothing else, about how the future might change. I hope you found it interesting. Um, if the school ever reopens and you want to come and have a look at some of our printing systems, then drop me a line and I'm sure we can arrange it. Um, otherwise, I'll see you soon.